we have an esteemed guest who uh, will be introduced more formally in just a moment. But it's my job to welcome all of you and to simply say this is a remarkable uh, conversation I hope we're going to have today. We've been in a, a breakfast meeting and had a, a lovely, deep, and important conversation. And I fully expect the, uh, the public event will also track that same way. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome His Excellency Archbishop Bashar Warda to our campus. And I think you're in for a great treat in his remarks and then in the, the conversation afterwards. So thank you for coming for this incredibly important and indeed pressing subject. I think most everyone in this room is familiar with the plight of Christians and other religious communities in Iraq in the face of the atrocities committed by ISIL. Uh, many people here on the faculty and even in the student body have spent a lot of time working either directly or indirectly, having spent considerable time working with government agencies to defeat ISIL, working with NGOs to provide humanitarian relief and development aid, or faculty teaching about the issues that are unfolding there, or even people working with specific religious communities directly to provide support and remedy for the people of Iraq. Uh, our esteemed guest, the Archbishop, is here today to give us his first-hand account of life, not only in his community, but the state of religious pluralism in Iraq itself. Archbishop, we're honored by your presence here, and we're looking forward to hearing your remarks, and uh, we certainly wish you all blessings in your crucial work and in your ministry going forward. It's now my pleasure to introduce Thomas Farr, who many of you know here. Uh, Tom is an associate professor of the practice of Religion and World Affairs at our Walsh School of Foreign Service. He's also director of the Religious Freedom Research Project at the Berkeley Center where he is a senior fellow. So Tom, please come. Thank you, Sean. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce His Excellency Archbishop Bashar Warda, Chaldean Catholic Archbishop of Erbil. As most of you know, Erbil is in the Kurdistan region of northern Iraq, not far from Mosul and the Nineveh Plain, a city and a region which were for millennia the ancestral home for hundreds of thousands and now, alas, tens of thousands of Christians, Yazidis, and other minorities. Mosul and the villages of the Nineveh Plain were overrun by ISIL in the summer of 2014. In some respects, Bashar Warda's life as a priest and bishop prior to off ISIS may seem to be somewhat conventional. But now it is clear that he was being prepared for the crisis he now faces. Ordained a priest in Baghdad in 1993, Father Warda received his MA in theology at the Catholic University of Louvain. In 2009, he was elected as Archbishop of Erbil at the Synod of Bishops of the Chaldean Catholic Church in the following year, he was consecrated after receiving the consent of His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI. Archbishop Warda has also immersed himself in the life of the mind and in education, something that he is going to be speaking about today. He's authored several books and numerous articles. He teaches at Babel Theological Seminary in Erbil and founded several Catholic schools in Baghdad. In 2011, he founded the Mar Kardak School in Erbil, and in 2012, he initiated the founding plan for something that I think is critically important to the future of uh, Iraq, and uh, particularly northern Iraq, the founding plan for the Catholic University in Erbil, which opened its doors in November 2015, when ISIL was still uh, at large. God has now called this man to shepherd a flock in crisis. Since the ISIS invasion, Archbishop Warder has become perhaps the leading international voice for the persecuted religious minorities of Iraq. He appears regularly in international media and travels uh, when he can to speak for this community as he is doing today. His primary responsibility, of course, is the welfare of persecuted and displaced Christians especially those who formerly lived in Mosul and the Nineveh Plain and have suffered forced expulsion, torture, rape, and death at the hands of ISIS. Over the past four years, he has been responsible. This man has been responsible for ultimate oversight over food, housing, education, and pastoral care. 
for nearly 20,000 threatened Christian families. Perhaps most strikingly for our purposes today, he has relentlessly pointed out that while the United States government has been generous in its aid to Iraq, very little of that aid has reached the Iraqi Christians under his care. He has been able to provide food and shelter only through the generosity of private Christians and Christian groups and because of help from the government of Hungary. We hope that is about to change. That is, that sufficient U.S. aid will soon be provided to help Christian and other minorities return to their homes in northern Iraq. If they do not return, we will be witnessing a triple tragedy. The failure to respond to a humanitarian catastrophe of the first order, the elimination of Christianity from a region where it has existed for over for two millennia, and very importantly, the elimination of any possibility for the kind of genuine religious pluralism which could help stabilize Iraq in the future. It's important to emphasize that the assistance the Archbishop has received from private, mainly Christian sources has not been expended solely for Iraqi Christians. Archbishop Warda and his colleagues have also provided housing and medicine from, for Yazidis, Muslims, and other non-Christians displaced and brutalized by ISIS. In doing so, he has exemplified the compassion of Jesus, who taught us to love God with all our hearts and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So let me end by observing that within the Catholic Church, today is the second day of Lent, a time of penance when Catholics unite themselves to the suffering of Christ. The Christians of Iraq have experienced an extended Lent, a time of deep and terrible suffering. But as Archbishop Warder never tires of telling the world, Iraqi Christians have not abandoned Christ. Many have fled their ancient and ancestral homeland perhaps never to return. Some do seek to return, however, and to stay. But wherever they are, they will serve to remind all of us, Catholic or not, of the meaning of love, of courage, and fidelity to God and to neighbor. He too provides us such a reminder. Please welcome to our campus the Good Shepherd of Iraq, Archbishop Bashar Warda. Good morning, and I would like to thank Georgetown uh, University for welcoming me, and uh, especially uh, Sean and Tom for, for the introduction, and all of those here uh, at the Berkeley Center who made this visit possible. It is an honor to speak to you today. Today I will speak to you on the future of religious pluralism in Iraq, uh, as a Christian, I will, of course, speak mainly from the viewpoint which I know best. But uh, the challenges which uh, face the Christians are the same as those uh, that face all religious minorities in Iraq, uh, by Yazidis, Kakain, and or even Muslims themselves. And that challenge is clear to identify. How does our land, uh, our land overcome the endless cycles of uh, persecutions and violence that repeat themselves with an regular horror to all of us? The harsh truth to this question is that without an end to this persecution and violence, there is no future for religious pluralism in Iraq or in anyone else, anywhere else in Middle East for that matter. The brutal logic of this is that there does eventually reach an end point where there are no minorities left to kill and no minorities left to persecute. Absent uh, any changes in behavior and intentions from those who rule over us, such is, the bleak, uh, f such is the bleak future of religious pluralism in Iraq today. As for Christianity in Iraq, we are now in what is for us a moment of truth in which we must honestly acknowledge our situation. Special, especially, I will address three main points. 
can Christianity and non-Muslim religious minorities survive in Iraq and the greater Islamic world? Second, if so, what is the proper role of Christians? And third, in performing this role, what forms of support can the West provide? Following more than 1,900 years of existence in Mesopotamia, uh, we Christians of Iraq now find ourselves on the very age of extinction, from land where the martyr's blood nourished the earliest flowering of faith, our church contributed to carrying the, the good news as far as way to India and China. Our Christian ancestors shared with Muslims, Arabs, a deep tradition of thought and philosophy and engaged with them in a dialogue respectfully since the eighth century AD the Arab Golden Age, historian Philip Jenkins has noted, was built on the scholars from the Church of the East. Now we face the end in Iraq, the same end faced by the Iraqi Jewish before us, and the same end now being faced by the Yazidis, with whom we have suffered so much pain alongside us. We Christian, people who have endured persecution and patience and faith for 1,400 years now confront an existential struggle. It is possibly the last struggle we will confront in Iraq. The most immediate cause is the ISIS attack that led to the displacements of more than 125,000 Christians from our historical homelands and rendered us in a single night without shelter without refuge, without work, without properties, without churches, without monasteries, without the ability to participate in any of the things which give us life of dignity. Family visits, celebrations of weddings and birth, and the sharing of the sorrows. Our tormentors confiscated our presence while also seeking to wipe out our history and destroy our future. And yet, we are still there, scourged, wounded, yet still there. And having survived thus far to this point of near finality, we have been granted a position of clarity and courage that we have perhaps lacked or avoided up to until this day. We can no longer ignore the fundamental cause of what has been a rentless persecution of our people for a nearly a millennium and a half, having faced for 1,400 years a slow motion genocide that began long before the ongoing ISIS genocide today, the time for excusing this inhuman behavior and its causes is long since past. When a people have nothing left to lose, in some sense, it is a very liberating, and from this position of clarity and newfounded courage, I must to speak to you honestly on behalf of my people and speak to you the truth. The truth is, there is a fundamental crisis in, within Islam itself, and if this crisis is not acknowledged, addressed, and fixed, then there can be no future for Christians or any other form of religious plurality in Middle East. Indeed, there is, a, there is little reason to see a future for anyone in, Mid in the Middle East, including within the Muslim world itself, other than in the context of continued violence, revenge, and hatred. And as we have seen too many times, this violence seeks to overtake us all, and destroy venerable, innocent life wherever it can find them. As a frequent visitor to United States and Europe, I understand and appreciate the difficulty of this subject. But for us, for we Iraqi Christians, this is not an abstract matter or a theatrical or pol political or academic question. 
And as an Iraqi Christian, I stand before you to witness the love of God for us that, and confirm our faith in Jesus Christ, stressing that as a people following the persecution by ISIS, we are far, very far stronger than we used to be. But we were not always this way. Prior to the ISIS horror of 2014, we Iraqi Christian had historically endeavored to maintain a dialogue of life with Muslims. In this dialogue, we refrained from speaking honestly and truthfully to our, to our oppressors in, in order to simply survive and live quietly we would not openly face the long history of violence and murder inflicted upon us. We did not push back against the continuously recurring periods of extremism that inflicted such pain and violence against our ancestors and against so many innocent people, both Muslims and Christians alike. But following the horror of ISIS, there is nothing left for us now but to speak plainly. There is a crisis of violence in Islam, and for the sake of humanity, including the followers of Islam themselves, it must be addressed openly and honestly. At the root of, this, of all of this, we must be straightforward about the reality of the teaching of jihad which are the justification for all these acts of violence. Apologist for the history of the, more than, of the last four, one, 1,400 years of oppression against Christians will point to the various periods of Muslims' tolerance regarding Christians as a possible and a desired alternative to the other periods of violence and persecution. One cannot deny that such periods of relative tolerism, tolerance have existed. And yet, all such periods of tolerance have been a one-way experience in which the Islamic rulers decide according to their own judgment whether the Christians and other non-Muslims are to be tolerated in their beliefs or not. It is never and has never ever been a question of equality. Fundamentally, in the eyes of Islam, we Christians and other non-Muslims are not equal and are not to be treated as equal, only to be tolerated or not, depending upon the intensity of the spirit of jihad that prevails at time. Such is the cycle of history that has recruited in the Middle East over the past 1,400 years, and with each successive cycle of the number of the Christian and other Muslims have decreased until we have reached the point which exists in Iraq today, the point of extinction. Argue as you will, but this, this coming extinction will likely soon be fact. And what then will anyone be able to say? that we were made extinct by natural disaster of gentle migration, that ISIS attacks were unprecedented, or in our disappearance will the truth emerge, that we persistently and steadily eliminated over the course of 1,400 years by a belief system which would allow for regular and recurring cycle of violence against us. In these past years, I've spent some time uh, in this country and have spent time also learning to understand your brave and never-ending commitment to equal rights for all citizens and the power with which you utilize your freedom of speech. And I will tell you that you were to stand, truly stand, in the shoes of the Christians of Iraq and those of, uh, of many others countries in Middle East you will not accept for one day, for one hour, one second, the status under which we live today and under which we have lived for centuries. 
by our country's very constitution, we are citizens of lesser nature, deserving of tolerance from our self-appointed superiors, but at their this creation only and not in our own inherent right as equal children under a loving God. So where we ask, is, this, is there is hope for the future in any of this? Should an ancient peaceful people be allowed to simply perish without comment, without objection? It seems an almost absurd question to ask in these modern times, does it not? Well then, we object. We object that one faith should have the right to kill another. We object and we say that if there is to be any future for the Christians and other religious minorities of Iraq and the Middle East, there must be a change and correction within Islam. We are asking whether ISIS is true when we are asking whether ISIS is truly an Islamic state or a wrapping of Islamic theology, consider the following words recently quoted in, Times magazine, in Time magazine. I quote, Western politicians should stop pretending that extremism and terrorism have nothing to do with Islam. There is a clear relationship between fundamentalism, terrorism, and the basic assumption of Islamic orthodoxy. So as long as we lack consciences regarding this matter, we cannot gain victory over fundamentalist, fundamentalist violence within Islam. End of quote. And I quote, the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims, the relationship between of Muslims with the state and Muslims' relationship to the prevailing legal system wherever they live, within this classical tradition, the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims is assumed to be one of surrogation and enmity. Perhaps there were reasons for this during the Middle Age when the tents of Islamic, ortho tents of Islamic orthodoxy were established, but in today's world, such a doctrine is unreasonable to the extent that Muslims adhere to this view of Islam, it renders them incapable of living harmoniously and peacefully within the multicultural, multi-religious societies of the 21st century." End of quote. These words come not from the right-wing political figure in the West, but from a leader of the largest Muslim organization in the world, Indonesian Islamic leader Yaha Stakov. At the present, these sentiments may be more fully developed among Muslims in Asia than in the Middle East, but post ISIS, when now hear we now hear similar forms of, uh, from, from Muslims in Iraq. Clearly, ISIS has shocked the conscience of the world and has shocked the conscience of the Islamic majority world as well. The question now is whether or not Islam will continue a political trajectory in which Sharia is the basis, basis for civil law and nearly every aspect of life is circumcised by the religion or whether a more secular, tolerant movement will develop. The West has not seen for some time anything like the totality religion-based theocratic system in many Islamic majority countries. Why is it that the West find is unremarkable that an organization exists called the Co-Organization of Islamic Cooperation with representation at the UN, etc., but there is no similar organization of Christian cooperation? Or organization of Buddhist cooperation. And what, and what is it like to live under this, a system in which the faith upon which every law is based defines you as infidel, or at best a second, even third citizen, class citizen? Too often, it has been for religious minorities in Iraq like it is with ISIS. 
and even when it is not, it has been always a slow squeezing of our community. Secular observers in the West make two major mistakes in considering Islam. Either they consider it religious in a Christian post-papal state sense, which is to say somehow removed from politics, or they view it through the lens of the mid 20th century when more secular governments held sway in the Middle East and in turn held political Islam at bay. But those largely secular government, including those of Hussein or Gaddafi or Mubarak, are gone now. Now please, do not misinterpret me in this to mean that these governments were without serious problems and deep injustice in their treatments of the people. They were. But in their place now is something that is clearly worse chaos, violence for all. And just beneath its surface flows the constant current of political Islam. And so now, in the Middle East, we have moved from fear to terror to horror. Where next? One common misunderstanding that I wish to address with you in all of this is the idea that the defeat of, I, the, of Daesh or ISIS means the defeat of this ideology of structured persecution and discrimination against non-Muslims. This is very far from the truth. In fact, while the physical fighting force of Daesh may have been defeated in, in a military sense, the idea of re-establishment of, of the Khalifat has been firmly implemented in many minds throughout the Muslims' world. And with this idea the, of the Khalifat, there comes all the formal historical structure of inter interna intentional inequality and discrimination against non-Muslims. I speak here not only of Iraq. We see leaders now in other countries in Middle East who are clearly acting in a way which consists with the re-establishment of the Khalifat. How will you then in the West react to this? My question to you is not rhetorical. The religious minorities of the Middle East wants to know the answer. Will you continue to condemn this never-ending structure, structured persecution against us? When the next wave of violence begins to hit us, will any of you in, in this campus hold demonstration and carry signs that say, we are all Christians or we are all Yazidis? And yes, I do say the next wave, wave of violence, for this is simply the natural result of a ruling system that preaches inequality and justifies persecution, justifies perse persecution. The math of this equation is not complicated. One group is taught that they are superior and legally entitled to treat others as inferior human beings on the sole base of their faith and religious practice. This teaching inevitably leads to violence against any inferiors who refuses to change their faith. And there uh, have been, they have it in the history of the Christians and religious minorities in, in the Middle East for the last 1,400 years. In considering this, I hope that the Catholic Church experience may be one of the use to Muslims grappling with these issues. After all, just a century and a half ago, we had a papal state and a much more politically oriented Christianity in places. But we developed away from that, getting back to the roots of our faith before Constantine and embracing again the Christ's words, my kingdom is not of this world. What is the proper role of the Christians? Fundamentally, this change must come about as a conscious work of Muslims' world itself. 
we see the small beginnings, perhaps, of this recognition in Egypt, in Jordan, in Asia, even in Saudi Arabia. And we have some good examples of this change in many other Muslim communities. And we've been hearing some courageous voices from Islamic leaders concerning the need of change and the need to address this, this issue openly. It should be encouraged. Certainly, much remains to be seen as to whether these actual sense, is there a, an actual sincerity in this. But we Christians should not remain passive or simply pray for the best. We too have a critical role to play, a role which brings us back to the beginnings of our faith. Ours now is a missionary role to give a daily witness to the teaching of Christ, to show the truth of Christ that we might provide a living example to our Muslim neighbors of a path to a world of forgiveness, of humility, of love, of peace. Let's be any confusion here. I am not, I am not speaking of conversion. Rather, I am speaking of the fundamental truth of forgiveness which we Christians of Iraq can share and share from a position of historically unique moral clarity. We forgive those who murdered us, who tortured us, who raped us, who sought to destroy everything about us. We forgive them in the name of Christ. We forgive them. We forgive them not only for the last four years, but for the last 1,400 years. And so we say to our Muslim neighbors, learn this from us. Let us help you heal. Your wounds are as deep as ours. We know this. We pray for your healing. Let us heal our wounded and tortured countries together. One may ask, how can we Christians in our diminished state provide an example at all? So many of our people have fled and so few of us are left. Some estimate have us now a barely 200,000 Christians or even less. But among those Christians who are left, I can tell you there is a core of the faithful who will not leave. And while it's true that our numbers are now small, the apostles themselves were far smaller. We take, the heart, we take heart from the first chapter of Acts. All these who with one accord devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. This is now our role, all of us with one accord to devote ourselves, not to exist in the shadows waiting for the next handout of charity, hoping to be somehow passed by in the next round of violence, no. We will devote ourselves, as our ancestors did, in the same land nearly 2,000 years ago when they first accepted the teaching of Christ in a world that was just as dangerous and uncertain as our present time. We Iraqi Christians are the children of Mesopotamia, and our ancient land is among the first places in the world where the teaching of teachings of Christ found good earth in which to grow. We will stay and bear our witness there and pray that we will see the end of all of this darkness. In performing this, will, in the, in performing this role, what forms of support can the West provide? As we Christians of Iraq, look to devote ourselves to a clear example of living witness to the teaching of Jesus, what forms of meaningful support can be provided to us from the West? First, there is a spiritual 
spiritual and moral support. Spiritually, we ask you to please pray for us and do not forget us. This solidarity with our Christian brothers and sisters around the world has sustained us in the past four years. And we are indeed of this strength even more in the times ahead. And here I have to acknowledge with grateful heart all the prayers, all the support which, have, which was sent and given to us, granted to us by so many devoted and really loving brothers and sisters in Knights of Columbus, Aid to the Church in Need, Catholic Relief Service, Kenewa, Bishop Conferences around the world, all the Chaldean community, and so many others, uh, the list is long, to thank them for the support that they're giving to us and made us live in our lands until today with courageous and strong commitment to continue. Spiritual support is needed. Moral support is needed. We ask you to consider our situation truthfully as it exists for us actually and not to stretched attempt at historical relativism which was diminished or more honestly insult the reality of our suffering and thereby seeks to rob us even of the dignity of our continued faith. Concerning political support, we ask you that we ask that you support efforts by your leaders to ensure equal treatments for all minorities in Iraq so they could really put pressure on the concerned personals in the governments of Baghdad and Erbil really to ensure these rights. And there are great chances to work in those two governments, especially if we speak of the government of Kurdistan, which we have received a lot of welcoming and support in the past years since 2003. And I would say there is a great chance to continue from there. Also, concerning political support, in this we pray that your policy makers can find in themselves the humility to recognize that their theories, which over the pa past decades have become our horrific reality, have been almost universally wrong, based in fundamentally flawed assessment of the Iraqi people and the situation. And in these mistaken policies, designed in, in comfort and safety, safety from f afar, argued even in the media, as partisan intellectual talking points, hundreds of thousands of innocent people have died. An entire country has been wrapped apart and left to the juggles. This horror all began with policy, and we beg those of you who continue to have access in shaping policy for your country, the most powerful on earth, to daily remember that your policy assessments have a life of death consequences. Please walk humbly and make sure that you, yet, that you truly understand the people on whom you are passing sentence. Finally, the West can provide material support. Here I am not speaking primarily of charitable aid, but of intelligently placed support to help us develop sustainable ways of life and income within, the Ira within Iraq, the Christian community has historically been a trusted providers of education and health care. These two areas can continue to provide us with legitimate self-sustaining platforms in our fight to hold a meaningful place in, Iraq, in Iraqi society from which we can continue to share Christ's message and display our Christian witness. We welcome and seek long-term partners in these fields. We especially hope that scholars assembled here, young and old, will think to come and share with us at our newly Catholic University in Erbil, which we hope 
can be a beacon for religious freedom and tolerance in the heart of the Middle East. Friends, the non-Muslim religious minorities of Iraq may be facing the end in the land of their ancestors. As Christians, we acknowledge this. In this end, that looms like such a dark cloud above us, the entire world faces a moment of truth along with us. Will a peaceful and innocent people be allowed to be persecuted and eliminated because of their faith and, and for the sake of, of not wanting to speak the truth to the persecuted persecutors? Will the world be complicit in our elimination? Friends, I am an Iraqi Christian. I hope and pray that our people can still survive in the ancient land from which we have been born. I pray that those of you in this room will help us to survive in our homeland and not as lots migrants in the same foreign and in, in some foreign lands. But if we are to become extinct in Iraq, the world should understand this. In our path of, to extinction, we will not go quietly any further. From this point, we will speak the truth. The life without and life without, uh, out of truth in full embrace of our Christian witness and mission so that if someday we are gone, no one would be able to say, how did this happen? We Christian are a people of hope, but facing the end also bring us clarity and with this courage to finally speak the truth. Our hope is to remain in our ancient land, now rest on the ability of ourselves, our oppressors, and our world to acknowledge these truths. Violence and discrimination against the innocent must end. Those who teach it must stop. We Christians of Iraq, who have faced 1,400 years of persecution, violent persecution, violence, and genocide are prepared to speak our truth and to show our witness to our oppressors and to the world, whatever the consequence might be. Please pray for us and thank you for your listening. God bless you. So is this on? Yes, it is. I can hear myself. Thank you, Excellency, for that magnificent uh, speech full of truth, historical truth, uh, contemporary analysis, and if I might say, the truth about Christianity. Um, your, your interlude about forgiveness was, among many other parts of your remarks, uh, terribly moving and I think terribly revealing, uh, not only of you, but of the people you represent. So we have about half an hour, uh, and I would like all of you to um, engage the Archbishop, if you would like to. Uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Father David Hollenbach for the first question. He's coming around, Father. Thank you very much, Archbishop Warda, for this m very moving presentation that you have given us about the situation being faced by Christians in Iraq, and uh, it's very deeply touching, so thank you uh, very much for what you have said. I would like to raise uh, a question with you about some implications of the challenge that you have put uh, before us. The description of the fact, the way you have described the possible coming to an end of Christianity in Iraq and other parts of the Middle East is a very deeply distressing picture of the situation being faced there. And it puts me in mind of the doctrine proclaimed at the United Nations back in the year 2005 at 
the World Summit uh, held by at the General Assembly, leading to the view called the responsibility to protect, arguing that nations of the world have a responsibility to come to the aid of people who are facing genocide, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And it, from your description, it, you have used the term genocide, slow motion genocide, in fact, regarding the situation being faced by Christians there. So the doctrine of the responsibility to protect says that the initiative to respond to people in that kind of crisis situation should be initially through diplomatic efforts, by political means, by humanitarian support, and other peaceful means. And it leaves open the possibility that the use of military force as a last resort could in some circumstances be justified to come to the aid and protect of people who are facing this crisis situation. I take it from what you had said about the fact that most of the policies being fo have been followed in the West regarding Iraq have been wrong would suggest that you think that military activity is not the right way to go. It has already happened by the United States but has uh, moved forward in a way that uh, has led to the creation of the disintegration of Iraqi society in ways that have led to these internal conflicts coming to the fore in a way that is very... But you have suggested, therefore, I, I take it that there are ways that we can exercise greater diplomatic and other forms of nonviolent efforts to come to the aid of the people, uh, the Christians and other minorities being faced by persecution and severe, uh, even genocide uh, in Iraq. So I would like to hear a little bit more from you about that. And one other dimension of my concern in light of what you said about some of the brave voices, the word was the phrase you used to describe some voices within Islam who are standing up to say there has to be respect for minorities on an equal basis. Uh, it seems to me that this leads open the possibility of genuine interreligious dialogue to advance uh, the cause of equal respect for minorities in uh, Iraq and other parts of the Middle East. And I would like to hear what you think about, in addition to political humanitarian ways of assisting um, the people of uh, Iraq who are suffering persecution as Christians, how interreligious discussions could actually help move that forward to come to their aid. So that, those are really two questions, and I would like to bring them to your, to your attention and, and welcome whatever response you might let, care to make. Um, I do believe that uh, we have to use all the possible means uh, to make the needed change uh, whenever we have uh, or we experienced uh, a period of oppression. Uh, so we all are committed to use all the diplomatic uh, uh, pressure that we would like to see, as I said, the, the regimes uh, that were there uh, were oppressing uh, rights of the people were uh, really denied. Some people will uh, wrongly would always view that s they would say, so many times they've told us, uh, you Christians were in a better situation with Saddam's regime. I would say, how comes? I mean, when I was preaching uh, on Sunday morning, I know that at least there are three to four from the intelligence security uh, present at the at the uh, the, uh, the community, which none of them know of each other, and all of them, after the mass, would report to the uh, to the government what uh, Bashar has said in his homily, what what he's been doing, and how comes we've been we we were quiet, we were quiet politically because uh, we know it from the beginning of the 70s the Jesuits were sacked, and they were forced to close their uh, their institutions because what was a liberal f uh, voice. Uh, all the schools were nationalized, so the education was uh, really observed by the government. So how comes that we were in better situation? No, it's wrong. 
so change was needed, but the way, the means, there was, a, I think, some political, uh, diplomatic pressure needed. When it comes today also addressing the issue of, uh, of Islam and the problems that the, of violence in Islam, some of the also uh, politicians or the West diplomacy sometimes um, they want not to embarrass themselves with countries which they have a great relationship, like economic re relationship. So they try to hide certain facts or not to speak about these facts. For example, genocide, issues like that. Well, it's better not to address these questions and these issues. Less would affect uh, some economical issues that we have with this country and that country. But if you if you go uh, if, uh, if you see it, there are some courageous voices from these Islamic countries are talking about the need of change. I mean, how comes that if we have some Muslims who are brave enough to say no, there is something happening here and we have to address it? How comes that a uh, 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 politicians from the West is trying not to open these issues when whenever it's possible with the government? Because there is a need to change the, some issues in the curriculum, uh, which has been uh, taught from in the primary and secondary years. There are lots of needs to be changed. And the, these countries have, have at least realized. So I would say, when it comes to the issue of genocide, which was, I mean, uh, I, I really, uh, I'm grateful to, to the Knights of Columbus, which they took the issue, and with other, uh, I mean, people to took the issue and make it quite clear uh, as, yes, there is a genocide, but the, we did not see that much of efforts and strong th that support that was needed for this, because if this was really giving the, the needed support, other Muslim countries will take responsibility because of this declaration of the genocide. So I would say, yes, there is a lack of efforts in, in this, and we could address why this have happened and there, why there is the lack of efforts. Uh, back again, uh, whenever I speak uh, uh, and we meet with the Islamic scholars and imams, uh, especially in, in the beginning of, of ISIS attack, they were saying, uh, I mean, ISIS does not, does not represent Islam, and we have this statement of the, I mean, uh, of condemnation and stuff like that. But I told, I told them, brothers, uh, I really accept and respect these statements, but it's not enough. Because in your statements, I don't have any, I don't see any words of apology to the vic victims. Because these tor horror were made in the name of Islam, in the name of Allah. You don't mention anything in your statements. Please, apology for the, for the victims is needed. It's not enough just to say uh, ISIS does not represent Islam. We need more. Face the truth. What about the victims? Victims of, uh, I mean, we have lost uh, 125,000 Christi displaced Christians. The Sunnis were over 4 million. 4 million Sunnis were displaced because of ISIS. Yazidis. Who would, who would make the apology? Who would tell them, we are sorry, so it's not enough, and there was there was a change. So I see, yes, there is uh, there is um, a quite possible uh, channel for inter for honest interreligious dialogue, uh, and that would not come from outside, but would would emerge from the dialogue of life, which we have to address these issues uh, honestly. But still, we need the support the support of the international community to implement all of these doctrines. Okay, we had some hands here, but we have a couple of questions on this side. Do we have another mic over here? Okay, the gentleman in the back. If you would please identify yourself and any affiliation. Uh, Stanley Cobra, I'm a Georgetown alum. I have been reading in the Kurdish press that there is ethnic cleansing going on now in Kurdish villages, that uh, Iraqi militias are showing up and ordering the Kurdish inhabitants to leave these villages. They are showing up in Iraqi government vehicles, according to these stories. 
which suggests the government in Baghdad is complicit. And I was wondering if you have any information on that. Well, I would, I would say, as so many Iraqi politicians would, would acknowledge today, the political process which uh, emerged in 2003 was built on wrong fo foundations, and if there is any foundations, which led to this sectarian violence. So I would not be surprised uh, to hear about any stories of sectarian violence against any groups, because this is the case since 2003 until today. And until today, we haven't seen this, what we call a strong mechanism to face this really in, in, in a way that would put an end to it. So I will not be surprised uh, to hear any uh, of the stories uh, such as uh, this, this sectarian violence. Right here. Um, Jack Rusenko, the George Washington Amity Series. Uh, thank you, Bishop, for your comments. I was wondering if you could comment on the state of your church from a spiritual perspective, not, uh, you know, before, looking before 2014, spiritually where the people are, and then today, what changes have you seen among the people in your church? Uh, the first thing I would uh, say that the people when they were persecuted and displaced they run not to uh, camps or to any uh, governmental facilities they immediately came to the churches and we opened all of the churches as uh, refugee camps uh, and this was really a, a call uh, a responsible call from our faithfuls that this is our ha house, the eternal house. You are the one who should provide everything. And you could tell everything. And we were living together for 24 hours in the same building uh, with 700 family, refugee families and other churches. Um, this, the faith gets stronger because we together meditate together why this is happening. Some angry voices were there. Where is God? Where is God of all of this? Why this have happened to us? We were never part of all of the sectarian violence. And believing in the words of gospel that God will give you uh, at the right time the, the right answers to say, uh, th for the first time, I was angry also because seeing all of this flock coming f and during the night, walking 14 18 hours, what you could tell them. But the answer was, uh, God is walking with you. God is, is walking all the way from, from Karakosh, from Karamnes, from Bartolla, from Batnaya, was walking with you. So please uh, accept this and uh, allow us to serve you because in serving you, we are serving you and serving God. And so churches are full today. Uh, we've been conducting also some spiritual uh, courses, not just masses, but also some educational and theological courses at the Catholic University uh, of Erbil, in which up 500 young people participated every Friday in a course for four hours every Friday, which was supported by the Knights of Columbus, to study theology, spirituality, uh, all of these issues. So. And our young people uh, have realized, and everyone have realized, that there is a treasure that some people would, would like to steal it from, from, from us, and we have to keep it, in, in a sense. I would be honest, also some people would say, mm, we, we have not been appreciated at all in this land. Uh, we have to find other place to live our Christianity. You know, this is the, their rights. I cannot stop anyone from, from looking and thinking about the future of his family, of his children. Some people left to Jordan, to Lebanon, to Turkey, and they are living in a very difficult situations. Other were able to make it to stay to Canada, to Australia, to Europe, but engage also again. I would say ISIS have raised the question, why? It's really value this uh, treasure that we have. Hello, I'm Jennifer Bryson from the Religious Freedom Institute. 
I wonder if you could tell us more about the Catholic University in Erbil. Um, where is its development at? What types of programs are offered? Who the students are? What languages of instructions? And your vision of it for the future? Catholic University of Erbil uh, was uh, one of the response to uh, to this, I mean, situation. Um, I would say the, at the roots of all of this, there is a, a lack of education, a lack of uh, interreligious dialogue, honest interreligious dialogue. We don't know each other. We are just we live together, but we try to prevent entering in certain area. So when uh, when it was proposed, the Italian Bishop Conference accepted the proposal and they donated uh, over th three million US dollars to build this university, which we now have. Um, it would host around 700 students, but today we are talking about 82, stu 82 students uh, enrolled in uh, uh, majors like economy, accounting, international law, computer science, information and technology, English literature, and uh, uh, oriental studies. Uh, the name Catholic University of Erbil uh, is the first, uh, uh, it was the first uh, licensed name in an Islamic world. Usually we have so many Catholic universities like Ma'duba, Beit Laham, Holy Spirit University, Wisdom, all of this, which are Catholic, but they don't have this name as as a licensed Catholic university in Erbil, uh, grateful to the government of Kurdistan, which they do and which they did understand the importance of this institution, uh, without really, uh, I mean, making any preservations, and they they granted the license, which made it possible for us to also get the license from Baghdad uh, last November. Uh, I would say uh, today we have four Muslim students. Uh, enrolled in the university, uh, being licensed from Baghdad and Erbil would give us more uh, of uh, Muslim students. My aim is to welcome as many Muslims and Yazidis within the within this uh, institution, uh, so they could uh, study together, learn together, know each other. That's important to know each other, not from media but from this interaction, and hopefully we would. With, with you and with other universities, we could form some institutions for religious freedom, which is needed. The, the response is always education. You have to know me, who I am, and to listen to me, and also I listen to you. Hi, good morning. Uh, James Chen from the Institute for Global Engagement. Um, I've heard that um, one of the main obstacles for people returning to the Nineveh Plains is uh, a lack of trust with their Muslim neighbors. And um, I was wondering if you agree with that assessment, and if so, uh, what, what are some ways that you think that reconciliation or you know, a healing of these relationships could be brought about? Um, I would understand uh, when my people would say we cannot trust our neighbors anymore because those are the same neighbors who, I mean, stole and burned and killed uh, our village in, in our villages. But uh, I would say also that I would remember the reaction of, of my people when when it's the same people in, in, the, in the part of Mosul were displaced recently because of the liberation uh, how my people went with food package to these camps and provide help to tell them you need it in, in that sense. The lack of trust is there. We have to address it. And when we say to our neighbors, we don't trust you, it's not a condemnation. It's just a reality because we could tell them this is part of being honest. I am I'm afraid of you because this would this have been repeated over the last decades and there is no change so show me so, some change i would rely here and i would encourage muslim countries islamic countries to come and step forward in helping rebuilding the christian villages the yazidi villages to show some sign of uh, solidarity 
uh, it's not enough statements of condemnation, but to show. And here I would, I would acknowledge the work of the government of United Arab Emirates. Since the ISIS attack, they've been with us, helping also uh, in all camps, Yazidis, Christians, Muslims, but giving specifically some good aid uh, uh, to, to the Christians. And now it's time. Uh, it's time to rebuild these Christian villages. I, I, I would love to see some uh, Muslim countries get involved and put these signs. It was built by donations of this country and that country to tell them uh, this, is, this is ways of, of showing. The Iraqi government, uh, unfortunately, they said we have no money left. To, to build, and they are depending completely on the donation that, uh, that's uh, coming. And, uh, you know, the recent uh, conference in, in Kuwait was one of the, they, they've said it several times, there is a huge need. So we depend on, 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 on donations. So it's not enough um, uh, uh, getting the churches and Christians building their, uh, their villages. I would, I would encourage other Islamic countries to step forward. Hi, Sayedna. Thank you for being with us here today. Uh, my name is Munir, and I'm a student here at Georgetown. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned a need for change within Islam, the need to engage in dialogue, and to support pluralism in the Middle East. What do you think our role is specifically as students, or as Christians, or as Christians from the Middle East living in the West, in engaging in this dialogue? Uh, how can we promote pluralism in the Middle East, and where do we start? Thank you. Uh, as I said, Prayer is needed. Uh, with it, uh, as a young people, you could use the social media. Uh, you are really brilliant in this. Spreading, uh, spreading good messages. Good messages. Uh, sometimes uh, there is a difference when you speak honestly, honestly, but respectfully in the way. I, I do believe whenever I speak to a Muslim, honestly, but respectfully, he will accept it because he knows that I love him. When I tell him that you cannot continue this way because it's a violent way, it's going to take your lives and the life, the life of your children. And we could show them example, uh, how many displaced Muslims were in Iraq, millions. So I think engaging in an honest and respectful dialogue with Islam there is a possibility for, for realizing that something should be changed. And sometimes I see that there is an attack. Attacks. This is not going to build a dialogue because if you attack me, I will immediately try. I will defend myself. If you want, this is a natural, I mean, reaction. If you attack me immediately, and especially being from the Middle East, uh, what do you expect? Uh, I will not say uh, immediately. I forgive you. Uh, probably I hold it before, but if I think if there is if we show respect uh, with honesty, there is a change. So students here and young people could use the social media to spread these messages, and I, I I'm sure that many Muslim young people will will join you, in, in really showing that uh, yes there is a need of change because. They are also victims of, of this violence. We are not alone. So I would encourage uh, using, using these, this way of respect, honesty with respect. What about a Georgetown student uh, group for religious pluralism in Iraq or for religious minorities in Iraq? It's an idea. Okay. Right here. Uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> welcome, Sayyid. Now, Luai Mikhail. Uh, Say so now I have a question about the, uh, as you know, Vice President uh, Mike Pence has spoke, uh, spoke about to shift the aid from UN to uh, Iraq to, to go directly to minorities. And as you know, USAID will have a conference in Baghdad in, in March 14 and 15. Uh, I don't know if you guys will be part of that uh, conference or not, but he, he said that those money will be used on revitalization and infrastructure building. Do you think the Hajj al-Shaabi and the, the uh, forces that they are there, the people don't trust, will be a, a gap and challenge for you for, the, for those money to go there and rebuild those areas again? Thank you. Thank you, Lay. Very good question. But first, let us see the, the, the donation and the help first. 
I mean, it's been promised. It's been a promise, and it's been months of discussion. And I think in March they are going to discuss again. So hopefully by the end of 2020, I don't know when, these would come in, in, in a way, no Hajj al-Shaabi, no Fresh Marga, no Christians will be there. So I would take this question to really say, please speed the process. Enough of discussion. Go there, be there, and start doing the work renovating schools it, and renovating streets, doing some uh, good good work there. We could go on discussion of this. The problem is that, yes, the promise is there, but the money is not there yet. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Robert Bond from Tesla Government Incorporated. Um, thank you, Archbishop Warda, for your remarks today. My question has to do with the right or responsibility, as you see it, of Iraqi Christians to influence their own political destiny. We know there are currents in northern Iraq that would advocate an independent, or if not independent, an autonomous region similar to the Kurdistan region of Iraq for Iraqi Christians. And I'm wondering, given your commitment to the cultivation of pluralism, religious pluralism in Iraq, whether that is a useful or um, legitimate course of action to pursue? Um, as you know, since 2003, we, we have entered a new era of, of political process. Uh, out of goodwill, we could say all Iraqi politicians uh, start to learning how to do politics. They were in the uh, what we call in, in a different position uh, against Saddam. Then when they moved to power, uh, they still have the minds of pre-2003 uh, in, in really ruling. And, and that's why they made really a mess of so many of these political uh, chances that was really giving. Uh, I would say even Christians, we have to learn how to do politics. Uh, in a, in a, within the context that we have. I mean, uh, in 2005, for example, when was a call for uh, an independent Nineveh plane, and I'm not a politician, please. I mean, you have to know this. I'm, not, I'm just saying it. We were in a much stronger position at that time uh, in number and qualified personnel. Uh, today, so many of our doctors, teachers, professors, qualified people left the country. Uh, the number has been from one million, almost one million and a half to 200,000, probably less. So circumstances have changed today. Uh, and that's why also probably the Iraqi Christian politician will have to learn how to make the best of it and aim high to get uh, what we could really, how we could ensure the rights of our people. I would and un I'd understand completely why our politicians are aiming so high because lack of trust, other issues. But I think as a Christian politicians, we have to learn some to do politics in, in such. And probably it would be uh, for, for this blessed center uh, a chance in, in near future to invite those uh, representing of the Iraqi Christian political parties and to discuss ways and analysis together and speak to them about, I mean, probably there are some uh, what we call uh, events or in the history uh, in, in many countries similar to the situation. So I think uh, the Iraqi politicians also not need, they need support, but also they need also this support that we could open ways of, of how to teach them how to do politics in that. But they do. They they do. They need this, the the support of of your center as well. So today, circumstances is different than was in 2005. But still, we have in that part of the world to aim high to get what we can for the people, for our people, to ensure their staying and existing, and to make uh, pluralism possible as well. Great question. Great answer. One final question here. Thank you. I'm Ann Wayne Scott. I'm from the United States Institute of Peace. 
Um, it seems very likely to me that a number of international organizations will be seeking to influence and engage with uh, Christian religious actors in Iraq. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about ways in which they could engage in constructive and sensitive ways as opposed to destructive or um, uh, offensive ways. So if you just talk about perhaps a successful example of a time when you partnered with an international organization and what that partnership looked like and, and what lessons there are for international actors. Uh, again, addressing the issues uh, honestly with the concerned personnel uh, in Iraq, uh, holding as many conferences and workshop, workshops and seminars on issues about the need for change, it's, it's, uh, it's important. Uh, speaking of the, all the atrocities, honestly, the cause of these atrocities, uh, honestly, uh, it's, it's, it's part of being respectful to, to, to the oppressors and to the victims. Uh, I think uh, we have not to be shy in, in addressing these questions. We have to work hard, as I said, to, to change the curriculum, to change some of the text, uh, educational text, some of the methods, some of the speeches that's, that's being presented in the, uh, in on, on, on Fridays, for example. It has not to be uh, what we call, uh, yeah, the respect does not prevent me from saying this is the disease, this is the disease that we are suffering. And uh, as I said, uh, I, I, I see that Muslims have suffered because of these sectarian violence more than Christians. But as a Christians, we cannot survive an another collateral damage. We cannot. I mean, there was, a, there was a, a religious persecution against Christians. Churches were bombed m prior to 2014. Churches were bombed, monasteries were bombed, Priests were killed, priests were kidnapped, Christians were kidnapped, bishop was killed. I mean, we, we have to address it, say it. this was done because of faith. Something was there. Of course, there are also other issues, criminal issues involved, but I, I think we have to speak honestly. And all of these organizations, when, when they come, they have not too shy on, on these issues. They should speak with all of the people especially choosing the right people. Some, sometimes we speak to uh, open-minded, moderate uh, scholars, Islamic scholars, with ha which they have zero influence on the street. Uh, okay, but uh, I could show you, uh, there was a program last, last month from an, is from a <laughs> an Islamic cleric. So he, he thinks that there is a possibility to conquer the United States. And the first thing he will say, he said, uh, the first thing we should do when we conquer uh, United States, in theory, he said, in theory, this is in theory, the first thing we should do is to speak uh, to them about the, the beauty of Islam. If they would accept, that's it. Otherwise, because they are people of the book, he, 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 he noticed that the Americans are either Christian or Jewish. They have either to pay jizya or otherwise, they will face death. This is was last month, from from I mean from a, a channel which has been I mean shown and followed by so many. So we have to speak to those people, invite them in, in that. And it's not difficult. It's not really difficult to uh, to even to address these issues with those people. Well, we're going to have to draw this to a close. My apologies to those with your hands still up. Um, I'm going to ask each of you. Uh, to, as Sean said earlier, each of you is here in some capacity from students to alumni of this university to uh, journalists, people who work in the policy world in Washington. Whoever God has put by your side, I would ask you to take the words of the Archbishop and, and use them, uh, whether it's prayer or the political or the moral or the uh, the financial, do what you can, because I think this is not just a Christian issue. It's a Christian. It's an issue of of human rights and and of uh, human dignity. And I know all of us, whatever our religious background or even if we're not religious, are supportive of this. Excellency, 
thank you. This has been a, uh, a wonderful, uh, deep dive into one of the great tragedies of our time. And so speaking on behalf of the Religious Freedom Research Project, the Berkeley Center, and Georgetown University, thank you for coming and, and gracing our campus today. Thank you.